There is no sin, which Paul and the other apostles detests more than when a person despises the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Still, there is no sin more common. That is why Paul can get so angry at the Antichrist, because he snubs Christ, rebuffs the grace of God, and refuses the merit of Christ. What else would you call it but spitting in Christ's face, pushing Christ to the side, usurping Christ's throne, and to say, I am going to justify you people. I am going to save you. By what means? By masses, pilgrimages, pardons, merits, etc. For this is Antichrist doctrine. Faith is no good unless it is reinforced by works. By this abominable doctrine, Antichrist has spoiled, darkened, and buried the benefit of Christ, and in place of the grace of Christ and his kingdom, he has established the doctrine of works and the kingdom of ceremonies. Who is this horrid person being described in this commentary? Who would arrogantly push aside Jesus Christ, claiming all power to pardon and save? In order to answer these two questions, we first must identify the accuser who penned these serious charges. This indictment came from the pen of Martin Luther in his Commentary on Galatians in the 16th century. Later in this diatribe, Luther also identified the one person he accused of being the Antichrist. He wrote, The Pope is the Antichrist because he is against Christ, because he takes liberties with the things of God, because he lords it over the temple of God. These are strong accusations. But Luther was not the only reformer who accused the papal office of being the Antichrist. These same allegations can be found in the writings of John Wycliffe in the 14th century, John Huss in the 15th century, and John Knox in the 16th century. John Wycliffe wrote, The Antichrist, the proud, worldly priest of Rome and the most cursed of clippers and cut purse has no more power in binding and loosing than any priest. John Calvin joined with Martin Luther and also accused the papal office of being the Antichrist. He wrote in his Institutes of Christian Religion. What then? Shall we recognize the apostolic see, where we see nothing but horrible apostasy? Shall he be the vicar of Christ who, by his furious efforts in persecuting the gospel, plainly declares himself to be Antichrist? Shall he be the successor of Peter, who goes about with fire and sword, demolishing everything that Peter built? Europe was angry. The hands of the Pope was drenched in the blood of all who died during his papal crusades and inquisitions. No longer was there a need to look for a coming Antichrist because the totalitarianism of the Pope fit the bill. One might think that with all this Antichrist vitriol swirling around the early reformers, a new shift in eschatology was circulating through Europe. But this was not the case. Martin Luther wrote, We have reached the time of the pale horse of the apocalypse. 
The world will not last anymore. If God wills it, then another hundred years. This quote by Martin Luther only shows that he believed he was living in the last days. Luther was not the only reformer who shared this opinion. In fact, the belief that the last days was upon the world was a common thread through most of the Reformation era. All the major reformers of Wycliffe, Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin generally accepted the official a millennial eschatology of the Roman Catholic Church. The reformers believed the millennium of Revelation 20 referred to the present age of the church. They thought the focal point of eschatology was not the consummation of history, but the future status of individuals before God. Bloody excesses among a few millennial radical groups caused the reformers to pull back from millennialism in stark horror. No major reformer developed a new millennial eschatology. In fact, Calvin and Zwingli became anti-apocalyptic in their writings. The reformers were not the only ones to use the Antichrist insult as a political tool. Pope Hadrian VI accused Martin Luther of being the Antichrist. He wrote, He has rejected the sacraments, repudiated the expunging of sins through fasts, and rejected the daily celebration of the Mass. Does this sound to you like Christ or Antichrist? These papal charges of Antichrist did not change anything. The Reformation had come to European soil and the accusations of Antichrist being leveled against the Pope could be heard in every corner of European society. The Roman Papacy had a serious public relations problem. The Reformation had its impact on Europe. Change was everywhere. The Roman papacy was losing ground to the Reformation on all fronts, and something must be done. The papal answer to the Reformation was the Council of Trent and the Jesuits. Pope Paul III wanted to initiate a counter-Reformation movement. Therefore, he authorized the formation of the Society of Jesus under the auspices of Ignatius of Loyola. This monastic order became known as the Jesuits. The primary responsibility of this order was to ignite a Catholic counter-reformation. The Jesuit order fought fiercely to extinguish the Protestant Reformation. Southern Germany, Poland, Austria, and Bohemia were won back to Catholicism by the repression and bloody slaughter of the Jesuits. The Pope reeling from these serious and credible charges of being the Antichrist commissioned the Jesuits to refute these charges. As long as a millennialism remained the bulwark of Catholic eschatology, the papacy would not be able to escape its indictment of Antichrist. To deflect these charges, a shift in apocalyptic thinking must occur. Along comes a Jesuit priest by the name of Franciscus Ribera from Spain, who proposed an interesting idea. Shift the book of Revelation away from Augustine's allegory to a future time in history. Franciscus Ribera developed his theory in his commentary on the Apocalypse of John. He used the writings of the premillennial patriotic theologians of the early church to formulate his theory that a personal antichrist would come just before the end of the world. 
and to be accepted by the Jews and enthroned in the temple at Jerusalem. This form of eschatology deflected the charges of Antichrist away from the Pope to a future coming evil ruler. Ribera wrote that the first few chapters of the Apocalypse applied to ancient pagan Rome, and the rest of the book he limited to a yet future period of three and one half literal years, just before the second coming. During that time, the Roman Church would fall away from the Pope into apostasy. The Jesuit Cardinal Robert Bellarmine fleshed out the theories of Ribera even further in his attempt to whitewash the image of the Pope. The root of the seven-year tribulation can be traced back to Jesuit propaganda. Robert Bellarmine returned to pure Augustinian root and insisted that the papal office could not be the Antichrist, but must be a single individual who would challenge Jesus at the end of human history. The Pope can't be Antichrist, because the Bible teaches that the Antichrist would be a future final evil villain. Two other Jesuits followed in the same vein as Ribera and Bellarmine. They were Francis Schwartz and Louis Alcazar. Schwartz challenged the Protestant reformers to prove their challenge of Antichrist against the Pope from a pure understanding of Scripture, while Alcazar wrote that the first 19 chapters of the Book of Revelation were fulfilled in the early history of the Church. Louis Alcazar is the root of the pre view of the Book of Revelation. The efforts of the Jesuits to cloud the Papal Antichrist indictment had little impact on Protestant charges of Antichrist, because widespread Protestant identification of the papacy as the Antichrist persisted until 1909 with the publication of the Schofield Reference Bible by Cyrus Schofield. This commentary promoted futurism, causing a decline in the Protestant identification of the papacy as Antichrist. 